Um, we have uh, with us Congressman Jim Moran. Is he is is he with us yet? I am. How are you, sir? Hi. Well, I'm not well given the larger context, but right now physically I'm fine, and it's nice to be able to talk with you. Thank you, Slim. All right, Congressman Moran, you you've seen it uh, before, and uh, what some commentators are saying that. This is another 9-11, what happened to Israel. Israel taking the place of America, Hamas taking the place of ISIS, and now Gaza is taking the place of Iraq, uh, where there was war uh, against uh, Iraq, even though the people of Iraq were not responsible for that. And definitely the people of Gaza are not responsible uh, for what, what happened um, in terms of the uh, assaults by Hamas. So. Can you tell us in the past what you saw as a member of Congress when there was uh, the drums of war in the Middle East, what you were thinking, what happened back then, and, and, and see if there are parallels with what we're seeing today? Uh, well, I can. I, I mean, it's, it's not an edifying um, description of the U.S. Congress. Uh, it's a very disappointing one. Uh, the, uh, you know, we... We oftentimes in a self-righteous mode talk about other countries being so corrupt. Well, the reality is that uh, campaign contributions have corrupted the United States Congress. And so uh, one of the motivating factors is how do, I, how do I please my political supporters, particularly my financial supporters? Um, the reality is that uh, the Jewish community and frankly to their credit, is deeply engaged in the American political process. And they're very generously engaged. Uh, it, it's only now that the Muslim and Palestinian and even some, to some extent, Arab populations are getting engaged, but uh, there's, there, I'm not sure they're ever gonna be able to, to successfully catch up. Uh, and so that's one of the motivating factors to, that causes the Congress to look the other way. Uh, when, where the Middle East is concerned. Uh, the, um, those who uh, care uh, enough to inform themselves uh, and who frankly care about human rights and, uh, uh, and justice, uh, they know what the right thing to do is, they're, but they're intimidated from speaking out. And that's always been the case. And that's why when members of Congress do speak out, people like Betty McCollum, for example, who's in a very important position as ranking. And at points, uh, when the Democrats are in the majority, she's the chair of the, the, the um, uh, Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, a very important position. And yet she's had courage to, to speak out. Um, uh, uh, there are a few others, but not a whole lot. Uh, when you get on that elevator, though, when you leave the floor of the House and it's members only, I remember members saying, uh, hey, uh, Jim, you know, I'm, I appreciate what you had to say. So, well, yeah, but, uh, you know, the, the thanks for not saying anything yourself. I said, well, I can't because of my constituency. And that's the reality. Um, so the U.S. has looked the other way when there's been any number of atrocities. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, those are the events that we remember, but there's a day-to-day -day deliberate degradation of the Palestinian population, um, uh, uh, trying in every way to deprive Palestinians of their dignity. It's exactly what colonial powers do. I mean, uh, Israel is not being unique in this way. You can think of what the North American European settlers did to the indigenous population. Uh, uh, the, and when they would strike back, trying to protect their land, well, they're savages. Uh, and, and all you would hear is that, you know, they're scalping uh, settlers. Uh, but uh, uh, England did the same thing in India, uh, Spain, Portugal, France. Uh, some were better than others, but every colonial power deliberately uh, deprived the people they were trying to conquer whose human and natural resources they wanted to acquire, uh, they uh, deprived them of their dignity and made them feel as though they were inferior, subhuman even. Uh, and, um, and, and some uh, Israelis have tried to do that with the Palestinian population. 
it, it's um, uh, it, what Hamas did is inexcusable, but it's not particularly inexplicable. Mm. Uh, it, when you cage 2.3 million people, deprive them of their dignity, really, of any real economic opportunity, of basic human rights, of the rule of laws that applies to the dominant population, uh, the domineering population, uh, well, you achieve your short-term objective. Uh, uh, but in the long term, uh, some of that caged population are going to uh, react. I, I, I don't want to uh, I mean, dehumanize Palestinians any, even more than they, uh, they have been, but they react as though they are a caged animal. Uh, and, um, uh, and so there were atrocities, but those atrocities don't represent anywhere near the majority of the Gazan population, let alone the Palestinian population. Uh, as, as you say, it is forbidden to uh, exert violence against innocent uh, 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 human beings. And, uh, but I, let me also say though, Salam, if I could, that it is not just those horrific atrocities that are not supported by, the, uh, by anywhere near the majority of the Palestinian population, but it was also stupid. Hamas was stupid in what they did. Netanyahu was in the most vulnerable political position he's ever been in his political career. Uh, the country was divided uh, and he had cobbled together uh, this, um, uh, uh, the, the people who had no business uh, in the same room together, but the extremists, particularly on the right wing, some cultists, uh, almost all bigots, frankly, uh, many of them with fascist tendencies. He cobbled them together to manipulate uh, the um, political system in Israel. And the people who were most opposed, in many cases, were the military, the IDF, the intelligence community. They live in Tel Aviv. They don't live in Jerusalem. They're secular. Uh, and, and, uh, and they had withdrawn their support. And in some ways, that may possibly have contributed to the vulnerability, the physical vulnerability that occurred in Israel. So what, do you, what does Hamas do? It invades, it, it, it makes Netanyahu all of a sudden a world leader that everyone has sympathy for. Uh, his whole country is behind him. Uh, all the world leaders are, are calling him, expressing sympathy, what can I do to help you? They all is forgiven, all Netanyahu's corruption, all of his manipulation of the laws, all of his attempt to overrule uh, the judicial system, it's all forgiven. And they have given him an excuse to perpetrate what many of his, I probably him, he himself, but so many of the people in that coalition want, which is basically an extermination of the Palestinian population, at least an excuse to kill at will in Gaza, and that's what he's going to be able to do with American weaponry. And I, th I think there's going to be tens of thousands of innocent civilians who will yeah. pay the price uh, for this action. And that's why I call it stupid. Uh, it, it's it, if you were trying to be strategic, you would do just the opposite of what Hamas did. And I, so, you know, it's tough to feel sympathetic at all for Hamas leadership, but it sure isn't difficult to find sympathy for the Gazan population, the Palestinian population, the world has turned against them. Although I wanna say one last thing and I'm talking too much, but I'm with my son here, I'm in Fredericksburg. We were driving back to Northern Virginia. We pulled over on William Street. It's right in the heart of Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. And we look at, and there's a commotion across the street. So we look over and, and Patrick starts reading the signs, peace for Palestine. Uh, 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 peace and justice in Palestine. It was a pro-Palestinian protest, and it must have been Mary Washington College students who had their, their facts right. They were talking about the $27 billion that's been given uh, to Israel and so on. I was stunned that would not have happened a few years ago. So things are changing, but unfortunately, just as the trend is beginning to change in the course of justice for Palestinians. This has to happen. And I, I think it, it, it makes justice 
all the more difficult to achieve right now. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and what do you think it, it will take to get our narrative out there? Because right now there is the frenzy, there's the hysteria. Uh, you have to issue your condemnations first before people would even think about talking to you. Um, it reminds me of what happened right after 9-11, that, that we were put in, in the straitjacket and not, you know, while we were making so much headway in terms of civic engagement and representation, we actually had a meeting on 9-11 with the White House that day, with the president to talk about Muslim participation in the White House. All that washed away after 9-11. And it seems that what Hamas did, as you uh, alluded to, is washing away all the work that's been done for Palestine. How do we recover and, and, and get that? Because it's important for America. It's not just important for the Palestinians yeah. in terms of American sentiment in the region and so many other uh, regional interests. No question. Well, first of all, it should be said that a, a principal um, uh, a, a promoter of the U.S. going into Iraq uh, was, in fact, uh, Israel and the neocons who... Uh, whose loyalty to Israel I, I, I thought in some cases was greater than to their own to the United States and they were they happened to be advisors to the president not happened to be they d were deliberately uh, and but the American people and these are, you know these are some of the lessons we have to learn even though as difficult as they are the American people didn't know the difference when they asked 80 percent of the American soldiers who were in Iraq why are you here they they said to get them back for what they did to us on 9-11 not knowing that iraq had nothing to do with that but yeah. but uniting all muslims arabs m m people in the middle east except for israel all of them together it was deliberate and of course uh, i know from personal experience that uh there were people within uh the um i don't know pro-israel lobby if you will and and, uh, and, and certainly within Israel, particularly Netanyahu, but uh, 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 Sharon and so on, who knew what they were doing and did it deliberately and successfully. So we have to bear that in mind. This is going to be tough. Um, uh, the, uh, but we have to start. Uh, we can't shrug our shoulders and give up. Uh, yeah. Fareed Zakaria had a very balanced show on CNN last Sunday, and he had... Mr. Bagudi, who it was so thoughtful. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Shibli Talhani, Talhami has been wonderful. Uh, but, but very few, but ve somebody's trying to call me here. Let me, let me decline that. Uh, uh, the, um, yeah. uh, there have been some, some terrific spokespeople and more and more people have to do that, but not uh, in an objective way, not in um, uh, a, a uh, you know self-righteous way or or in in, in any way exaggerating uh, the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, unfortunately, I'd love to see that done, but you have to just do it methodically, create the historical context. Uh, I do think you have to lay blame at the feet of Hamas, particularly for the, the atrocities. Although they are finding that a number of them that were reported initially have not been corroborated, but I'm sure there were atrocities. So we can't deny that there yes. were not, that there were actions taken that, that are totally inexcusable, uh, that should be condemned. Uh, but we also have to say, this is an opportunity to look uh, at the situation and, and try to prevent it from happening again. So let's look at the source causes uh, when you've got a population, 40% of whom are 15 or younger, what are you going to do about this youth population? You're not going to be able to kill them all. And obviously you shouldn't. And, and hopefully the world wouldn't allow that. So what, what are you going to do? Well, let's start with uh, the fair and equal treatment. Let's start with economic opportunity. Let's start with a, a better educational system. Um, uh, uh, right now, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to invest in Gaza there. And they're, of course, they're attacking uh, uh, Qatar because Qatar has, has been generous toward uh, the, the Gazan population in terms of its infrastructure. Although every dime that, that Qatar provides has to be first approved by Israel. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can't obliterate a population 
uh, that's that's committing genocide. We 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 have to be true to our values, and our values are equal protection under the law, human rights, the sanctity of life, everyone uh, is deserving of uh, of dignity, uh, and um, uh, and our values are that uh, we don't believe in colonialism, let alone bullying. Uh, we believe in um, uh, investing in in the better angels of our nature. Uh, it, when we come across as thoughtful, caring, uh, 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 obviously troubled by the atrocities, but trying to create a better future so this never happens again, then I think people will uh, be more willing to to listen. But this is going to be a very difficult time. Uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, people who understand the whole historical context, the, the injustice that uh, laid the seeds for the, these horrible acts, uh, that um, uh, they're able to kind of keep their cool, uh, to believe in, in a better future, uh, and, and to emphasize the fact that we're talking about human beings that uh, when they come to the United States, as Bill Clinton used to say, they become doctors and lawyers and educators and uh, just as successful, uh, uh, just as, uh, uh, as uh, intelligent and knowledgeable and caring human beings as you could want uh, within the American population. So we have to show our best side. We have to show that uh, 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 that uh, you know, Palestinians are not represented by Hamas. They're represented by the the, the best values of human nature, and um, uh, and and they want to work with the rest of the world and with those in Israel who are sincere about it in bringing about a better future, so that what happened last week and ne is never allowed to repeat itself again. Well, I really appreciate all your words, uh, Congressman. Uh, and I'm glad that we we're able to connect. I want to thank Khaled Safori for making this possible. He's a mutual oh, friend. <laughs> and, um, and that once again, we will uh, reconnect because I think you've, you've, you've laid out a very important framework for how to move forward um, in this. And it will take time, uh, just like the Iraq war. Uh, it, it took time for people to finally see how wrong it was. Unfortunately, it was too late by the time most people. Now there are estimates that 800, over 800,000 Iraqi children under the age of five were killed uh, between the two Gulf Wars. Imagine. According to Steve Simon. Steve How Simon. many people know that? I mean, Nobody. those are the kinds of statistics yeah. that speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, and definitely we'll, uh, we'll try to at least uh, uh, give people truth uh, that will hopefully shape uh, public opinion and force our uh, public officials to stand for the values that you outlined for all of us. So thank you so much for your and time. I thank people like yourself, Salam, and people in the audience who care enough to listen to broadcasts like this. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate You're it. Very welcome. Thank you so thank much. You. We'll thank talk you. again. Okay. Hope so. um, all right. And then uh, we wanted to bring on now uh, Muhammad Ali, our uh, director for uh, engagement with uh, our, our Congress. You just, <laughs> you just heard Congressman Moran uh, say that the U.S. Congress is disappointing uh, and that there's corruption and that they're more concerned about domestic politics, uh, i.e. their constituency and who's raising more money. And definitely he was uh, alluding to APAC and their uh, their tactics uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, and, and people like J Street are at least countering the, tax, the tactics of APAC. Uh, and, and J Street is, is, is an ally of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. So we don't want to stereotype the Jewish community or get into any anti-Semitic tropes uh, uh, about the American Jewish community, but APAC definitely uh, has given um, a bad image uh, in terms of how they uh, silence people and uh, how they, they, they really work hard to make sure that everybody just uh, walks that line of being uh, uh, giving unwavering support for the Netanyahu government, uh, and uh, and 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 sweep aside the atrocities committed uh, against the Palestinian people. So, Mohammed, you've been working on Capitol Hill for quite some time, and uh, have worked on national security issues, and 
I've been talking to people. What do you hear uh, over there in DC uh, on Capitol Hill? Um, thanks, Salam. Um, you know, uh, let me start from uh, you know by thanking the the congressman and. and you know, it's interesting that he mentions that when you get onto an elevator, the, the members only elevator, you're hearing, you're hearing something very different from what those specific members are then going out and saying. And, you know, it is it is very true that the pro-Israel community has been at this since the inception, since the creation of Israel. And we're just getting started. We are, you know, we being those who have a better understanding of the reality on the ground. And, you know, you need to be able to, um, if, if we're going to be successful, if we're going to be able to make progress on it, there needs to be there needs to be engagement, congressional engagement, community engagement when there isn't anything necessarily erupting like it is right now. Um, the the members of Congress they need to hear from constituents to be able to uh, to be able to have the cover they need to be able to make the decisions that they know to be right. Um, this I, I'm reminded of when I first started. I was an advisor in the U.S. Senate for a number of years, and when I first started, got on the legislative team. I had this wonderful idea, what I thought it was incredible, where we are we should limit arms sales to a certain country because of human rights violations and Chief of Staff looked at me and said, yes, it's absolutely an amazing idea, but, you know, it's a very standard idea. And, you know, there's no, we need to have the political cover to be able to do so. And that means our constituents must be reaching out to us. Those who are, you know, within our kind of ecosystem in orbit, they have to reach out to us and say, this is what we want and this is why we want it. And, you know, I was going to a number of different House offices, both, you know, freshman members and, and very senior members on important committees. And, and one of the things that kind of was said repeatedly is, was, you know, we, this is about as far as we can go in this moment. This is about as far as we can go five or six days out. And that as far as you can go was acknowledging that there are both Palestinian lives and Israeli lives being lost. And from one perspective, you know, it's agonizing, maddening and heartbreaking, heartbreaking that that is the extent of bravery right now but it also is perhaps reflective of engagement that there is that that we need to engage more. We need to be engaging at all times, and that it does lead to um, it will lead to results to not be so uh, to not be disenchanted, disheartening, disheartened. That there is the ability to affect change, but there has to be a kind of a longer view on that front. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck out to me was a uh, pretty influential member of Congress. Again, I, I can't name the names just because, you know, that's one of the, the, the if, if you are going to be able to get true insight, there has to be a degree of privacy. And she was saying, or he was saying that it is widely known that, um, that there is not going to be a military solution. Salami, you were talking about the Iraq war and the quagmire, the debacle, and just the horrors associated with that. That the U.S. has learned time and time again that these things need to have a political solution. What's happening right now? It's not going to be. Um, it's not going to have a solution that is military based. Um, and and this is what we're hearing from from members of Congress. They're directly telling us. They're almost. Some of them were almost apologetic in advance. That they have to get onto a resolution, despite the fact that they know that the language in it is not is not totally reflective of reality. And you know, when when we are kind of trying to engage them and advocate for the right thing, we then have to go back to our own constituents, our own supporters and say, this is the way that they, they might vote. This is the way that they might be talking, but it isn't reflective of perhaps what they think and what they know. I don't know if that's more frustrating for them to kind of vote against what they actually know, vote against what they actually believe. But it is perhaps um, encouraging that we don't have a... Um, we aren't trying to convince anybody of the facts. We're just trying to convince them of the fact that there is that, that you know, that they have a constituency that if you want, if if they want to count on our support when it comes to their reelection, when it comes to fending off a primary challenge, they have to listen to us. Um, and, 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 and that's been something of a kind of top line takeaway. Um, obviously, we one of the things that we were pushing uh, for is is ensuring that those members who are on the um, on, on oversight that they use that perch, that they use the ability to kind of really engage the State Department, the Department of Defense, to ensure that as we're sending money, as we're sending weapons to Israel, that those aren't you know that those aren't just then being able to use to to kill in cold blood effectively. That they are not being used to target innocent Palestinians. Even if you look at what's happening over the last couple of days. Um, critical infrastructure, hospitals, schools, and, and, and even mosques have been bombed and targeted. And, and, and um, it, it's just, it's, it's hard to believe that that, that has been an, an accident. Um, yeah. So, so uh, 
Mohammed, I want you to talk a little bit about um, how, you know, th there's a tendency that in, in cases like this where people feel helpless, that they retreat, they, they're, they resign. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, 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 of course, that's exactly what the other side wants. So what are, what do you tell people in terms of how to re-engage? Because, the, you know, if we invest, if we feel that the truth is on our side, it doesn't take as much uh, as, as what, uh, uh, you know, the, the other side is, is doing in terms of how much they're investing in manufacturing. I mean, there's so many uh, distortions of the truth that are happening now. There's a frenzy, there's hysteria. Uh, and, and we, maybe we just have to wait that out uh, and until, uh, you know, uh, people can think more rationally about the situation. But w what do you tell people in terms of reengaging with their member of Congress? Because at the end of the day, the Congress member has to listen to their constituents. Uh, don't stop. Continue to engage and don't expect results right away. Again, like the congressman was saying, that this is an, this is something that um, you know, the, uh, the supporters, the, the, you know, the staunch and steadfast supporters of Israel have, they've been doing this for 60 or 75 years. If we have entered into this arena for, for even a quarter century, while they're pushing three quarters of a century, the results are going to, um, the results are going to reflect that. And if we disengage, then, then what, then, then what political reason why would, would have uh, would a member of Congress have to stick their necks on the line to pursue something that is not politically expedient? Um, yeah. it's, it sometimes comes down to as something as simple as that, uh, give them, give, give members of Congress a, a reason to do the right thing right now. When we don't engage, there's no political cost to it because yes. they know that even if they don't believe it, that there's just, it's easier to just take the path of least resistance. So resistance in this form, you know, is, is engaging what is, um, you know, what makes the U S unique in some sense, which is that we have a democratic system. That means that they are they work for us, members of Congress, that is they are elected officials. And we need to remind them that we as American Muslims, as a, a Arab Muslims or as Arab Americans, they that, that we are here. We are listening and we are watching and we have a perspective that must be listened to. Engagement is without engagement. We don't have we don't have a leg to stand on. Yeah. If we aren't asking for something, then how are they going to deliver it? Yeah. Uh, do, do you do you support uh computerized letters like I just push a button and then a letter goes to my member or is it better to to write it personally or, or to meet with them? I would say if you were to rank it, I would say that uh, there's nothing worse than not engaging. Then petitioning is certainly, um, you know, the baseline that one should be doing. But getting a chance to know your member, look at what their priorities are, look at what committees are on and get a chance to engage their staff. It doesn't take all of that long. You can become an advocate for the issues that you care about. They're your they're your members. Just just write to them, talk to them any way that you can engage them in a as close to a one on one session or, uh, you know, that that sort of a platform. Do that. It could be something yeah. as simple as engaging them when they're uh, visiting their own districts, their own states. Right. OK, here's a question. Um, and I believe we're, we're expecting Ramsey Baroud soon. So we'll we'll transition to him uh, after we answer this question. You may not condemn Hamas for crimes based on media reports that lied to us about the Iraq war WMDs. Yes, there's definitely lies, uh, disinformation. I even remember back in 1991 that the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador said that Iraqi soldiers were throwing babies out of incubators. Uh, and uh, later it was it was reported that that was part that was uh, deliberately manufactured to get support. Uh, from the United States to uh, to go to war in, in Iraq. So, and then of course they lied about Iraq being involved in 9/11 after 9/11. And there definitely uh, there, there is disinformation uh, again happening. But as Congressman Moran said, we have to wait, unfortunately, to find out what is true and what was uh, manufactured. But we should be very careful about these so-called reports. Sometimes uh, the media just reports it, then they then they walk it back and say, we have no verification. So it takes a trained eye to really uh, see what was happening. Uh, however, we, you know, at, at the same time, uh, we have to separate Hamas from uh, the, the Palestinian people. Um, and so uh, th that, that, that is important. 
Uh, Mohammed, any last words before we go to Ramsey? Yes. One final thing that I'll say is um, if you were to uh, remove the actual issue, you want to learn from those who are very good at what they do. Figure out how APAC is so good at what they do. Look at the NRA, how they were so good at what they did and replicate it for the issues that you care about. Figure out how to apply those principles and stand up for what's right, what's, you know, how to do right by uh, Gazans right now. And it's going to take time, but we'll get there. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, you got to start somewhere. You can't keep waiting uh, for the problem to get worse. You, you have to keep engaging and, uh, and, and, and keep working for change. Uh, wherever you want to see change, change in the media, change in government, change in your neighborhood, change in your library. But but definitely you have to work for change. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Uh, Ramsey Baroud is uh, is our next guest. Uh, Ramsey uh, has Ramsey chronicled, chronicled, uh, a number of, uh, number of uh, in, in a number of books, number of books uh, the realities uh, affecting the Palestinian people. Uh, he himself uh, has has been to the region several times and is, is with us, with us here, all, uh, here on, the on the West Coast. Ramsey, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Salam. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so, Ramsey, I think Ramsey, you know, some of the things that we're talking about is the narrative. And the narrative, obviously, is one-sided right now. Um, give us your, you know, give us your, your observations. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this just like we have. A number of times we've been we've been through this many times where you have to withstand the the barrage of propaganda from the governments starting you know first and foremost they're trying to set an agenda uh it, the same thing happened in the iraq war uh, both iraq wars for that matter and now uh, and and it's happened uh, against uh, uh gazans several times uh and and it's happening before our very eyes so how do we deal with that propaganda war um, yes, of course. Um, uh, can you hear me okay with uh, without an echo? Yes, I can. We, it's yes, I it's can much hear. better now. It's, it's much better. Now. Okay, great. So, so basically, um, I don't think we we can use the old language, the old narrative on the narrative uh, anymore. This is beyond anything, honestly. I mean, in the past, that there were margins given to us Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims in this country and pro-Palestinian voices um, just made basically to convey uh, a sense of balance, however fraudulent it has always been. This time, the extremism uh, that uh, has been uh, in, in, the, in the media narrative is incredible. I mean, we, I haven't personally... Uh, seen American media united, speaking in one voice as a chorus behind Israel, behind any issue for that matter, as it has been these days. The question is, uh, the difference is mostly, I mean, nobody is disagreeing, go and destroy Hamas and Hamas's infrastructure and everybody that supports Hamas, but it's also blocking any attempt at at presenting a context, not necessarily supporting anyone, but perhaps imagining that there is a possible other interpretation of what's going on, that Gaza is, is a place that has seen the horrors of war and siege like no, any, no other region in the Middle East, that, that the number of children and, and people killed in the West Bank was the highest in 2022, according to the UN, compared to any other year since 2005. And by June or July of this year, became even higher than 2022. That Israeli uh, ministers and extremists have been pushing for a, a religious war, and sadly, they are getting it now. Mm -hmm. And there has been a built up of completely dismissing, canceling, marginalizing the Palestinian people, the Palestinian discourse, and any Palestinian aspiration for, for freedom. And, and just to merely suggest that this could be a possibility behind the anger that, that, that led to the Saturday event, events and or, or or anything else for that matter in terms of Palestinians retaliating or resisting is completely unacceptable. Uh, Anthony Blinken today said that 
the number of Israelis killed by Hamas is 9-11s put together. Now, he did not bother to do the math for how many Palestinians killed, because now the Palestinians killed is about 1,537 compared to 1,400 Israelis. So if you do the math, considering that there's the same demographics on both sides, then we are looking at 11 September 11th. But that doesn't matter. It wasn't even acknowledged whatsoever. The fact that he uh, made a mention of he's not visiting Israel as the as, uh, U.S. Secretary of um, um, as, a, as a U.S. Uh, diplomat, but rather as uh, as a as a Jewish person, again pushing this this agenda, this narrative that is basically telling Israel, you have not only our complete support and and sympathy, but you have a blank check to do with the Palestinians however you please, and the Israelis are taking that to heart, and that's precisely what they are doing. So we are screaming out there, trying to get some attention, but we are, in compared to the power of corporate media, we haven't as of yet been able to, to reverse or to push back effectively enough um, to debunk the myths and, and the lies and deconstruct the, the Hasbara, the propaganda. They have sealed this perfect propaganda scheme and we need to go out there. We need to fight in every possible platform, in the media, in the streets, on social media. We can't sit and sympathize and pray. We need to go out there and we need to use our numbers and the sympathy that exists within our supporters and their communities across the U.S., across the world, in fact, to try to push back. Because if we fail to push back, then the consequences are going to be even more dire, believe it or not, compared yeah. to what is happening right now. Well, you know, one of the issues that we have a problem with is framing, Ramsey. And that we, we frame things according to what we uh, aspire to or, or what our passions lead us to. The question that we have to ask ourselves, which I believe, you know, so many, you know, so many lobbies, we mentioned APAC, the NRA, even AARP, what they're good at is framing it to the average American. So how do we frame this issue? Why is Palestine important for America? Oh, you're muted now. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be too hard on us because that, that kind of suggests a degree of failure. Um, and, and yes, we have to be self-critical here, but it's not like we are... You know, this, these, these are not the 60s and, and, and the 50s and the 60s and where the likes of Golda Meir used to make such ridiculous claims as the Palestinian people do not exist. And, and, and that, of course, is functional. That kind of propaganda is absolutely functional in, in the way that Zionism behaves, which is a complete dehumanization of Palestinians. If they don't exist or they exist, but they exist in the form of human animals, as an Israeli uh, minister put it the other day, then whatever happens to them, it, it just simply doesn't matter. It, it just, it's not an issue. Um, but the, these are not the 60s and 50s and 60s. We have some of the most educated Palestinian intellectuals, scholars, poets, artists. They are everywhere in America right now. You can't find a single uh, uh, university, regardless of its of, of its degree of, of importance in this country in which you don't find a Palestinian voice. But we are absent because we are not allowed access. Now, that's different. So really, we need to keep that in mind. And this is why uh, many of us in, in invested in alternative media platforms. I mean, at the Palestine Chronicle right now, we are reaching one million people per day. I could have never imagined in my wildest dreams that this you know, small website that we started at one point during the second Intifada in 2000s would have that much impact. And yes, because there's a lot of professional work behind it, but also because there are so many people who are fed up with the narrative. So they are seeking alternative Palestinian platforms. So if you look at the impact of the Palestine Chronicle, the Electronic Intifada, numerous other uh, media platforms, alternative media platforms, we are taking a big chunk 
of, of that kind of thinking. Now, I have intentionally refused all mainstream interviews, mainstream mm. media. I refuse to engage with any of them, including the Seattle Times here in my own city, simply because I would rather invest in a small but a growing audience with our own narrative, uh, um, the way it should be told, than to invest in this kind of, kind of like, you know, this um, uh, simplified narrative in which our voices are muffled, muted, pushed to the bottom of articles just to say that they have in fact spoken to Palestinians. It doesn't serve a purpose. And and I know, and, and this is a call for, for all Palestinian and Arab and Muslim intellectuals out there, invent and create your own platforms. Yes, put pressure on the media. Don't spare the media. Don't give them an easy ride and give them a hard time, but make the real investment in your own uh, media infrastructure. It starts small, but over time, it will make a great impact. And, and I've seen this. I've seen it in Europe. Myself is not as manifested in the US as it is in Europe, but I remember going to certain parts of Europe 20, 25 years ago where they, you know, they've never met a Palestinian in their lives. And now many, many European societies are very much sympathetic with the Palestinian people. And now we are using them as tools of pressure against the institutional media, the official media, the corporate media. So I think we need to find the balance between investing so much in the hope that some corporate media is going to uh, become suddenly pro-Palestine for just because they agree with our narrative uh, uh, and, and the creation of our own media infrastructure in this country. And there is so much money. Our community has funds. They express these in, in building mosques, in building institutions, in building universities, in building schools. But if you see the way that how uh, you ask the question, how much of that money actually goes in building alternative media channels? Yeah, it's a tiny little percentage. I can't be effective lobbyist in Washington, D.C. if I mm -hmm. don't have a channel backing me up. Because at the end of the day, it's just me and a couple of guys. We are not going to make a difference. We need to think in a wholesome way about this. And we need to think long term about this. So we've actually gotten stronger than, than the past, uh, than 20 years ago. We, we are stronger. And we just need to keep working in, in building uh, uh, our infrastructure in, in getting our message out. Uh, Somebody has asked, how can we organize and form groups for people who are willing to engage? Uh, uh, what are some action items we can take? Oh, you're, you're muted again. Um, we already have established massive networks. Uh, the Solidarity Movement, BDS, uh, Palestinian uh, academics, um, activists, uh, uh, grassroots society activists in particular have in have spent uh, years building an infrastructure. It already exists. I know we are a bit bewildered by all of this. I feel like we've been knocked on our head, uh, our collective head all of a sudden, and we are trying to push back against all of these strange narratives about mass rapes and babies being beheaded and all of that. Um, but I think once we reorient ourselves just a little bit, we are going to delve back into these existing channels that we have invested uh, uh, in, whether with our unions, uh, with our uh, civil society organizations that are stand against war, uh, many progressive organizations, particularly with, uh, with Black Americans, with Native Americans, with, uh, with Latino organizations and that sort of thing. But we need to do this fast. We need to start the process of mobilization and organization fast. Because if, and this is the real danger, this is not about, oh, how unfair Blinken was when he said that this is 10 9 11s put together. It, what is terrifying about these kind of statements and language is that they are suggesting that we have reacted in tremendous way after 9-11 and we killed a whole lot of people. Well, Israel can do proportionately 
10 times as much to Palestinians. So there is not in too much time for us to sit and strategize and will on this. We need to activate all of our channels, all of the people who have worked with us and supported us and all the people that we have worked with and supported. They all need to come out right now. They need to contact their representatives. They need to contact the media. They need to go in the streets. There has to be enough upheaval that Biden, I, I know this is not going to liberate Palestine, obviously, but we are trying to push enough that the Biden administration is going to tell Israel, ease up. This is going to save lives. It will save lives. And, you know, saving the life of a thousand or two is actually worth all of this trouble, all of this effort. Because the numbers are stacking up very fast in Palestine. That's, that is what it's about. It's about saving lives. Uh, and, and it starts in Palestine. Thank you very much, uh, Ramsey. I, I, I appreciate, especially when you said you don't, you're not responding to mainstream media, but you responded to us. It really means a lot. And, and, uh, and thank you so much. We hope to reconnect very soon, inshallah. Thank, thank you for your wisdom. You. All right. All right. Um, so I just want to wrap up. Um, you know, many of us are disenchanted. This is not the time uh, to, you know, for resignation. Um, this is not the time for the faint hearted. This is the time uh, for those of us who are ready to, to stand up for the truth, uh, to, to call this out for what it is. It, it is a genocide against the Palestinian people. It, it is uh, it is not helping America whatsoever. It is a continuation of militar militarization of the region when there is no military solution. Now, we extend our sympathies to the American Jewish community for the, you know, their loved ones. Many of our friends had loved ones uh, who died, who were kidnapped um, and, and, and are suffering. Um, and we, we, we extend our sympathies to, to them and, and mourn with them. We, we live together here in America, um, and we want everybody uh, to call uh, out uh, the U.S. government for what it's doing right now, and that is endangering more lives, uh, including American lives, starting with Palestinian lives and using them. You know, what they call it, it's interesting, they, they, they abhor terrorism, but when Palestinian civilians are killed, they call it collateral damage. That is a euphemism. These are human beings and all human beings are equal. That is what this is about. As uh, Congressman uh, Jim Moran said, it's about equal protection of the law. It's about human equality and human rights. That's what the struggle is about. If, it's just, if you think it's just about going after Israel, you're wrong. If you think it's just about you know, outing somebody and, and exposing and say, I got you, you know, you're, you're, a, you know, you're a fool for doing this or a fool for doing that, you're wrong. If you think that this is about, um, you know, seeing who's holier than thou and going out and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, um, you're, 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 you're saying that you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the strong voice, you're wrong. It's about guiding America towards a path that is reflecting and abiding by our values as human beings. That's what this is about. And America is the superpower, uh, and, and it has a lot invested in this. Uh, and our future, the future of the region and the future of America, uh, will be determined by what's going to be happening in the next few weeks. So this is something that MPAC, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, will be involved in. And uh, some people are asking, what should, what should we do? social media, calling representatives, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. You should do both. Get, a, get, get the information right now. Look it up. It, it's easy to Google. Google up who's your representative. Google up who's your local news uh, on television and your newspaper. Call them and, and say, you need to hear the Palestinian perspective. You need them to listen to uh, those that are representing the other side, because the other side, our side, is trying to end war in the Middle East. And definitely there is no military solution for any of the problems in the Middle East today. Thank you very much for spending time with us. We will uh, get back to you in the near future, in the near future. Assalamu alaikum.